hopefully uh, everyone here can hear me. Um, hey, hello, hello to everyone. My name is Kai. I'm going to be your uh, webinar host for today. We're going to be talking about some of the basics of iClone. Um, today is kind of a, a webinar focused around um, people who are sort of new to iClone. Um, we're going to go through a bunch of like little uh, tips and tricks along the way, kind of talking about scene creation, uh, you know, the basics of, of, of getting started with iClone. Um, so if, if you're a beginner, this is fantastic. Uh, good, good introduction for you. Um, if you've been with iClone for a while, uh, you may even learn some, uh, some, pick up some new stuff here and there along the way. Um, this is actually going to be a two-part uh, webinar series. So the first part is going to be today. We're going to be uh, just kind of, you know, uh, talking about prop import. Now, uh, this is, as you can see here, I have them on the screen right now. This is the outline. And the last time we did this webinar script was two years ago. So it's uh, almost two years ago, October 2nd, uh, 2017. So it's quite a ways uh, back, back in the day there. And uh, so we're going to, I mean, there's, a, there's some updated stuff. We're not, we're not going to be importing from 3D Warehouse. I'm going to be using Sketchfab instead, um, using FBX from Sketchfab, since that's a bit more relevant in today's uh, workflow for most people, excuse me. And uh, substance materials, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we'll, we'll also talk about uh, PBR stuff as well, the difference between PBR textures and uh, traditional textures. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about lighting in, in this webinar. Um, near the end of the webinar, th this, this part one here is going to be more about setting up your scene and getting all your materials and props and everything all created. Um, and at the end, we're going to do a simple, really simple character creation, just a brief introduction to Character Creator 3. Um, and then uh, part two on Thursday, we're going to be talking about uh, mostly the animation stuff. Okay, so we're going to have our character uh, walking. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, camera movement and uh, dialogue between two characters. Um, so it's, it's going to be like I mentioned a two part webinar and uh, part two is on uh, Thursday. Uh, Thursday here, probably Friday in Australia or East Asia if you're uh, over there, Friday morning. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a brief introduction as to what we're going to be covering here and on Thursday as well. Um, and as always with all the webinars, we are going to have a Q&A session at the very end, the last 10 minutes of this webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, taking your questions. So in your uh, Zoom webinar panel there, there's a Q&A uh, button. You should be able to click that and enter in a question at any point throughout the webinar. I'm going to be answering them at the end though, okay? Um, so any, any questions you have, just put them in that Q&A section there and I'll get to those at the end. Um, in addition, we're sending out a survey um, that uh, we hope to get your feedback on. Any, any things that you'd like to uh, improve, anything you liked about the webinar, anything you'd like to improve, anything you'd like to see in the future, um, we're always open to your recommendations. So please uh, provide, uh, uh, fill out that survey and send it back to us uh, so we can better uh, you know, serve your needs in the future. And as a reward for doing so, we'll give you a 10% uh, coupon for the content store. Okay, so a 10% discount for anything you purchase in the content store. All right, and I think that about covers all of it. We're all, we are streaming this on uh, YouTube as well, um, in case uh, anybody is interested in you know, watching from YouTube. Um, you can go there and chat there as well. Okay, but I think, yeah, we'll just we'll go ahead and get started here uh, without further ado. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, before we move on, we have a weekly special in the content store here. I'm gonna put this uh, link into the chat window for you guys, okay? So I'm not gonna answer uh, any questions in the chat window, but I'm going to put uh, some links possibly in the chat window here as well. Okay, so this is a, a good special, you know, $69 from 168 list price. And this includes the uh, supermodels as well as our light studio bundle. Um, really cool lighting stuff uh, in this light studio bundle. We'll talk about lighting in just a moment here. And uh, the supermodels, it's, it's a very, very nice pack that has some really high quality uh, characters in there. Um, and uh, skin textures and all that stuff as well. So you can take a look at that uh, on your own time. Um, there's related content, new releases, and top selling here you can check out as well. All sorts of uh, cool stuff here. Okay, so that's uh, that's what it for the content store stuff. I'll just close that down, close this, this down here. We're going to be using this a little bit later, um, some uh, substance material stuff, and we're also going to be using Sketchfab a little bit later here as well. Okay, um, whoops, oh, I'll get that back later. Okay, so let's go into iClone without further ado and start our uh, live demo here. So um, in iClone, um, for those of you who are not familiar, we have the tabs on the top here in the content manager. Um, I'm going to be using with the basic, uh, I'm going to be working with the basic um, default kind of template for iClone uh, workspace. So if you go up to window and you go to workspace, I'm going to be using standard here, okay? There's different ones for different kind of uh, scenarios. I normally just stick with standard because I'm a boring guy. I just, <laughs> I don't like to mess around with all sorts of different custom settings. I just 
go with the standardized, you know, just follow, follow the, follow the leader. Right. Um, anyways. Okay. So there's a bunch of, uh, tabs here in the content uh, manager. Okay, so the content is where you can find all your content. The scene manager is where you'll, where you'll find everything in your scene. Currently, there's not really much in the scene except for some shadow catcher and sky stuff. And the visual tab, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, how you can modify the, tweak the visuals in your, in your scene. Okay, so um, there's, you know, you can find your characters, your animation, stage, set, media, and package all, all up here. We'll talk about those a little bit later, probably not in too much detail. But I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, projects here. Um, under the first tab project, you can go to template. And there's a number of different projects here. For characters, um, global illumination, GI stands for global illumination. I'll explore that a little bit later on as well. Uh, morphs and uh, PBR, physically based rendering. Uh, lookup tables, LUTs, and uh, IBLs and all sorts of stuff. But we don't, we're not gonna worry about all this stuff. We're only gonna be talking about this one project, the loft scene in the GI folder there, okay? So we'll just go ahead and load that up. And the reason I'm using this project is because it allows us to really, it's, it's kind of a complex project when it comes to um, all the assets that are included in, in the scene. And uh, it's kind of good to, good to deconstruct this because uh, you know some scenes can get fairly complicated. Uh, if we go over to the scene manager here, you can see we have all sorts of props under wall, we have, uh, under the scene uh, item here, we have you know, floor, all, all sorts of different objects. Um, you can select these. Uh, and if you want to, you know, if, if I select the TV, for example, and I press the F hotkey, this is a very important hotkey I use all the time. F, oops, where is it? Okay, maybe I can't select it for some reason. Let me see this here. Okay, forget that. <laughs> the hotkeys on my keyboard don't seem to be working. Okay, anyways, F should be the one that like focuses on your scene. Oh, that's because we have a, never mind. Up here under camera, we have camera switch. Okay, I'm just gonna go to preview and uh, just to get rid of uh, things in the first place here, I'm gonna just get rid of all the cameras since we're not gonna be dealing with all the cameras here. So under the camera section here, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete all those. And uh, there we go, we don't have to worry about cameras anymore. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to find the TV somewhere in my scene, I can select the TV, press the F hotkey, or A, S, D, or F, okay? F is the one I normally use because that's the front uh, of the TV, but in this case, it seems like D is the one that we want to use, okay? And then you can uh, zoom out and you can find that's where the TV is, okay? Like pillow A, for example, press the F hotkey, here it is, okay? So that's, that's a quick way to kind of go uh, between little objects in your scene. Use that F hotkey, really, uh, really useful, okay? And uh, some, of these, uh, some of these props in our scene have a hierarchy, and that's because they're attached to each other, like pillow A, B, and C are attached to sofa, okay? So if I press the W hotkey, which is my movement gizmo right here, I can move around my sofa and all the pillows will move along with it, okay, just like this. By clicking and dragging on this gizmo. I can select individual pillows and move them separately. Okay, so this is the point of it, attaching items to other items so you can move them all together at once. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm going to skip over this pretty quick because it's very basic stuff. But any questions, please feel free to put that in the Q&A section. I don't want to, you know, go too fast for anybody um, because this is a beginner uh, webinar. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, um, if you're on a um, kind of a slower computer, this scene in particular will become, you know, very, uh, very heavy on your computer. It'll uh, lag your computer quite a bit. And what I find in this scene is if we go to the sky here, there's a sky. And if we uh, go to our uh, um, visual right here, or uh, sorry, with the sky over here in the modify panel, you can see the sky, we have um, a diffuse map and a glow map. And it's a fairly big uh, texture, 4096. Uh, so 4K texture for the sky. If we zoom out, You'll see this is the sky right here. Um, we can take down the glow, increase the glow. It's not gonna do much in this case. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna delete the sky in this case since we don't really need it. Um, there's other, other things we can do to create lighting. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select that sky, just delete it. Okay, and then everything will go dark. And let's go back into our little, I'll just give you a kind of an overhead view of our scene here. So we have these trees, these are speed trees, okay. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, delete those and see, I can just click on tree, select them all and then delete. We don't need those in our scene right now. 
and everything is in this little box here. Okay, so if we zoom into the box, just like this, there you go. We are now in here. Okay, so let's take a look first at the lighting in this scene. I want to deconstruct the lighting uh, slightly. Okay, just kind of show you how these how the lights are made. So let's twirl up the props uh, folder right here, and under lights, we have a number of different lights. Uh, you can easily activate or deactivate lights by clicking this little uh, icon here. Okay, now this is the key light is deactivated. Okay, so when you when you deactivate the key light, it's a directional light. It'll stop casting those shadows because you'll notice beside that we have a little icon here called activate shadow. All right, this one has no shadows. So all of these lights here, this one has a shadow, this one has a shadow, but three of them don't have a shadow. It's kind of hard to see. But if you see a little shadow below the sphere there, that means it has shadows active. If I, for example, deactivated or activated my key light right here, and then I decide to deactivate shadows like this, this is what it'll look like. So it's not casting any shadows. So basically the light is going directly through the wall. Um, the wall is not stopping it, it's not casting shadows. And there you go. If we wanna see where this uh, light is coming from, we can press the forward slash key, okay? And when you press the forward slash key, you can see the gizmo, uh, press and hold it, by the way, you can see this gizmo pop up and we can rotate it. And that'll be our main uh, source of light. We can move it around the scene like this. Okay, and you can animate this as well. If you wanna learn how to animate, we can talk about that later. Very simple stuff though. Okay, that's our main uh, light source. Now, if you want, you can go ahead and you can adjust uh, you know, the, the strength of this Let's just go ahead and turn off all the other lights just to kind of focus on this one here. Okay, yes, it doesn't make much of a difference because these other lights are just kind of fill lights. And we can talk about that a little bit later as well. But we have a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use this one key light just to keep things simple. And we can turn it on or off from here as well. Notice that when it's off, we still have light in our scene. And you're probably wondering like, you know, where the heck is this all this light coming from? It almost looks brighter when our, our main light is off. And that's because we can go over here to our visual tab and we're using image-based lighting, okay? So this image-based lighting, it basically takes a, uh, an image map like this and wraps it around the entire scene. Imagine the scene is a big sphere and we are inside the sphere. So what it does is it wraps this image on the inside of the sphere and uh, casts light from different areas of this image onto your scene, okay? So if we deactivate IBL, there you go, it'll get really dark, okay? Just like this. And uh, if we want, we can also go into this further and there's still lights coming up. So we have this ambient light color up here. We can click on that and you can see it's almost black. It's nearly basically black, but if we take it all the way down, there you go. Everything will be black and we can take out that fog as well. So this could be like a kind of a creepy horror movie uh, or horror video game or something like this. You'd have the fog and the you know, dim lighting and everything like this. So it looks, you know, Fairly, uh, fairly creepy. We'll take the fog off for now. And there's still this light over here. So there's only a single light on in our scene. And you have to find that light. It's actually a prop light. So we're gonna go over here to our props and we can just double click it actually over here. And you can see pendant lamp, right? This is the, this is the culprit right here that's casting light. You can see there's spotlights, boom. Take that one off, take that one off. Now everything is completely black, okay? Except our, uh, our background. Okay, ours. there you go, okay, so we can turn those back on. And uh, yeah, so let's go back and uh, turn on our main light. And there you go. And then we can adjust the multiplier value, which is the strength of this light. So like a value of five, for example, we'll make it really bright, like it's almost in, in the morning time or something. So There's some nice uh, you know, light being cast uh, through the uh, window in the morning time. Okay, and we'll just focus on this side because the outside we don't have any images yet. Um, you can take the shadows on or off this way as well. You can adjust the shadow darkness, okay? Make your shadows very high contrast or very low contrast, okay? So these are just various ways that you can kind of tweak your, uh, your shadows and your, and your lights. Uh, we'll kind of keep this maybe at a lower value, maybe two or something like that. So this looks like almost like an evening. And if we wanted to, you know, emphasize that kind of evening atmosphere, we'd probably, uh, we can click on this little swatch here, this little color swatch. We can change this to a warmer color, like a nice yellow, right? Something like this. Let's move this to the side. That's okay. Okay, 
maybe even look further into the orangish. Something like that. Okay. So you can really tweak the lighting that way as well. And we'll talk about this in more detail kind of uh, as, as we move along. Um, probably in the next uh, next day, we're going to be talking about more like tweaking your scene um, on top of the animation. But I just kind of wanted to deconstruct the lighting there for you as well. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, th I think um, another thing to mention here as well is when you're in a small like enclosed space like this, uh, you can see if I zoom out, it's easy to zoom out right out of the entire room. Okay. So um, just zoom out a little bit, it'll go out of the entire room. One way you can uh, avoid this is you can go up to create your own camera. So create a custom camera, go to create and camera. And what you can do is you can adjust the focal length of the camera. So if I choose a focal length of like 20 millimeters, for example, but we need to, yeah, there we go. 35 millimeters means everything seems closer. 50 millimeters, okay. So you can see with a focal length of like 50 millimeters or even 80 millimeters, even like one little slight zoom will move out of the entire scene like this, okay? So the basically the higher the focal length here, um, the more close together everything in your scene is going to seem. Okay, so 200 is pretty crazy. 20 millimeters is going to be ideal for this situation. So you want to keep a very low focal length, and this is because it allows us to see more of the room as we're navigating around it. Okay, so hopefully that uh, helps you out with there, uh, with that. Um, and there's lots of other uh, settings here for cameras that uh, mostly have to do with export to uh, to other programs like Maya and Max and stuff. Um, we won't we'll talk about that in this uh, in this uh, tutorial here, or in this webinar, rather. Okay, and if you want to turn those walls off, you can do so as well. Maybe I find the walls kind of annoying. Um, you can press the Q hotkey and just select something. Okay, but if, if it doesn't seem to be selecting when you click it, just press the Q hotkey, and you can like double click it, and it'll normally select it, like the T table right here. There you go, and we have wall A and wall B. We can make these walls invisible by clicking the visibility button up here. Now keep in mind, this is not going to animate the visibility. There's two different types of visibility in iClone. Uh, there's the visibility that you can find in your scene manager here with this little eye icon here. And there's also this visibility up here. Now notice that this visible, this icon here is green, okay? And whenever you see anything green in iClone, like the move, rotate, scale values over here, anything that has green that's in green can be animated. You can use keyframe animation to turn it on or off. So if you wanted to toggle the visibility of the walls on or off throughout this scene for some reason, you know, while it was playing, you would use this visibility, okay? The visibility over here is only used for, uh, you know, when you're previewing your scene or doing other things like that. You'll notice that uh, there's no longer any uh, shadows uh, being cast by those walls at that point. Okay, um, there we go. Okay, let's bring in a, a more of our lights. This scene's kind of dark. A little dark for the summertime. i bring in more of our lights here. You can see these are all just like fill lights here. And we'll talk about the details more of, uh, of fill lights versus uh, point lights and, and uh, key lights um, if we have time at the end of this tutorial. But we have a lot of other stuff to go through. Um, I want to import in a couple of things to our, to our scene. Um, use Blender to kind of separate some, uh, some of the mesh. And on top of that, we're going to um, import in some other stuff and create some characters as well. OK, so the next item of business here is we're going to just uh, rearrange our scene a little bit. I'm going to go over to uh, this shelf over here, select this uh, shelf. And uh, I think this shelf, you know, it kind of just breaks up the room. I don't like this shelf here. I ain't no interior designer, but uh, it's getting in the way. So I'm going to select that shelf and just delete it. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this uh, um, table over here. You can see this dining table here. If I select it, it's an entire set. So if I twirl this down here, you can see the dining table item includes all the dining chairs. So there's a group of like four dining chairs. Let's just zoom in so you can see a bit better there. Okay, you can press the W hotkey to move them around separately, just like this. Okay, you press Control Z to undo that. And there's a teapot you can select separately, the plate, and all this stuff. We can zoom in really close and get some nice. I'll look at all the nice details of all these items here. Okay. Anyways, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, place this um, dining table set over behind our sofa. Okay, so I'm just going to click it, I'm gonna click and drag it over here. And uh, maybe I like it better rotated to the side slightly. So I'm going to press the E hotkey and the E hotkey will change my rotation gizmo. And then I can move it like this. 
Now notice that when I, when I move it around like this, the value over here, the Z axis, the rotate Z axis is changing as well. Okay, so notice that you just change it like that. So if you're a stickler for angles and you wanna to get to like a perfect angle, you can snap the angle as well if you want. There's snap options for moving and rotating, which we can talk about later. But uh, let's see, I'll just put like, you know, minus 90, okay? Could be plus 90 as well. It wants to be the other way around. There you go. I'm just gonna go ahead and leave that negative 90. Okay, just flip it over on the other side there. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take this, uh, we're gonna export this um, uh, dining set into Blender. And we're going to then uh, basically take these chairs one by one. We're gonna only be using one chair. I'm gonna show you how you can kind of just take, cause they're, they're all put together in a single mesh here, okay? So uh, what I need to do is I need to separate them all. So the best way to do this is you can export directly from iClone into FBX format. Or what you can do is you can go ahead and edit in 3D Exchange. I'm going to show you how to edit in 3D Exchange really quickly. The way from iCloud is to go File and whoops, Export and Export FBX here. Okay, and you can do that as well. And you want to make sure that you have, uh, um, you know, your target tool preset, whatever you're bringing into Blender, for example. Um, you can just ex export the current frame and uh, you know, delete hidden mesh doesn't really matter. Uh, you want to embed textures. Let's just show the, the difference in these two exports here. I'm going to go ahead and export this. Um, let's go to our desktop here and let's call this a folder. Let's make a temp folder here. We already have a temp folder. Let's call this, uh, well, just new folder is fine. Okay. We'll call this IC export chair. Okay. Save that to our desktop slash new folder. And then we can also go to edit in 3D exchange. And close this down. We can just go to uh, select the dining chairs. So because only the dining chairs were selected, that's what we exported. Uh, that's into 3D Exchange here. So it's just a really simple mesh here, all these dining chairs together, right? Now let's go ahead and load up Blender really quick. I'm gonna find uh, Blender, where is it here? That was on my desktop. And I'm just gonna import all that stuff in. Okay, so let's go ahead and delete our Whoops, the cube there and import in. Um, now, what I'm going to do from 3D Exchange is I'm going to import, actually, I'm going to export as an OBJ, okay? And uh, I'm going to show you the difference really quick here. So we'll go to just select these dining chairs right here and just select export as OBJ, okay? And we'll just call it, um, you know, chairs. Okay, now export selected only, yes. Uh, we don't need to remove hidden mesh or anything. Um, you can merge opacity to diffuse textures, doesn't really matter. Um, this other option you only need to use for a lumbic base. Um, let's go ahead and export this to that same folder. Our desktop, we have the new folder here. And uh, let's create a new folder here called OBJ. And let's just save it to that OBJ folder. Okay, because OBJ will have like all the textures and everything in a separate folder. It'll export all the textures and everything together. Okay, so then we can go to our uh, desktop here. And uh, ba, 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 ba. new folder, and there's our iClone export chair, the FBX file. Okay, and in our OBJ we have the uh, OBJ right here. Okay, chairs and all the texture files and everything are with it. Okay, and uh, textures for the iClone uh, for the chair are all here. For the FBX way down here. Um, we didn't do that really properly. Um, so what I, what I prefer to do in this case is export to OBJ uh, when, when using Blender, just because it makes things a bit easier. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. We're going to go into Blender and File and Import and Import FBX, or sorry, Import our OBJ. Wavefront OBJ, there we go. And let's find that folder here. Desktop, new folder, OBJ, chairs.obj. Okay. And um, should be in here any moment. Oh, there we are, way out here, okay? So, and the reason they're way out here is uh, what you can do before you export to OBJ in 3D Exchange is you can scale them down. So the, the scaling in, in Blender and iClone is a little bit different. So if I, if I select this dummy here, this uh, Control D, this dummy here, 
you won't see it up here, and that's because it's kind of off the screen right here, way over here. So these chairs aren't really centered. They're centered according, they're positioned according to where they were in our scene. Okay, um, so that's something to keep in mind. And what I want to do here is select this uh, item right here and just go ahead and reset um, the position, the transform position. And then you can also, you know, scale down. Um, you can um, press the R hotkey, you can scale them down like this. Um, like I mentioned, the blender size uh, scale export a little bit differently. But if you do that, then you won't come across this problem where they're like way over here off to the side and, uh, you know, uh, kind of annoying to get to. Um, although it's not, ter not too terrible. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to, in Blender, just use the uh, Z uh, wireframe mode. Let's tab over to, uh, instead of object mode, let's use uh, edit mode here. Okay. And I'm going to just uh, press the Z hotkey to use this uh, mode right here. Instead of uh, rendered, we'll use uh, the wireframe mode here. And uh, I'm just going to rotate it on top here a little bit. It's, I'm not really used to the Blender uh, um, navigation. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of all these chairs except for one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, and the way I, the easy way to do that is kind of just press the C hotkey, and uh, oops, no, we're in the wrong mode here. Oops, oh, that's because I'm doing this. Okay, oops. Oh, Control C. And click and drag. Oops. Nope. Oh, control left click and drag. I think it was control C. All right, control left click and drag, and I'll create your uh, last suit tool here. <laughs> oh, I just forgot all these like Blender hotkeys. I've used Blender for ages. Oh, let's just Z this here again. Control left click and drag. I'm going to collect uh, select all of these, and uh, we should be in edit mode here. Goodness sakes. This should work here. Okay, I just deleted everything. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Okay, let's try it now. There we go. Okay, it's not deleting all the vertices. It is a few times here. I could use the, probably the uh, select, uh, multiple faces or whatever, but uh, I'm just not really super good at Blender. So apologies for like, you know, taking you through this process here. There's probably someone out there that knows a much easier way to do this. And I think it might just be the angle that I'm using as well. I'm not sure why it's not selecting everything. Gosh. Never had this problem before. Normally it just deletes everything. This is crazy. I use this mode here. There we go. Okay, yeah, I was in the wrong mode. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Okay, sorry guys. <laughs> I was in uh, the uh, wrong mode, the incorrect mode here. Um, okay, so let's just go to uh, the regular mode here. And we have this uh, chair. So now we're going to export this chair. And there we go. And to FBX file. Okay, it doesn't really matter. OBJ or FBX, we can do both because uh, 3D Exchange will support both. So file export, and let's go to FBX. And let's just uh, zoom it to our desktop. We'll call it the uh, chair singular. There we go. That FBX and export that. There we go. Okay. So that should be all the blender we need. And let's just import in the uh, chair singular from our desktop there. Nope. Okay. All right. So there we got our chair. And uh, what I want to do is um, you can see that the uh, scale is really huge here. Let's just reset the position of everything here. I'm going to align to ground. And uh, sorry, align to center here and then press the F hotkey. And you can see that there's our grid. So this chair is absolutely massive, you know, compared to our grid. Um, so there's a couple of things we need to do here. Let's just uh, scale down to like maybe one and then press F hotkey. 
Okay, and there's a, okay, there's our right there. So align to ground and let's just reset the position. F hotkey, oh, reset the scale as well. All right, so you don't want to reset the scale. Um, there you go. And this, uh, this yellow little dude here, by the way, this uh, control D, this is the actual size of a human in, uh, in iClone. Okay, so I want to keep that in mind. And uh, that's basically it. And I think we'll just, uh, our scene root, if we use this right here, world axis, that'll show our scene root right here. Okay. So if we want to, you know, adjust this position slightly, we can. Um, let's just reset transforms, um, singularizes pivots. Oops. And that should be okay if we press the W hotkey. Um, we can adjust the pivot point. Let's go to bottom center. And uh, we'll just work with that for now. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just export this into iClone format, file and export. And there we go, iClone 7, export geometry. We'll call it searching uh, chair singular as well. Um, we can uh, opt to select visible only, selected only or all, okay. And our textures will be fine. This will be an FBX export. So let's go ahead and press okay. And there we go. And uh, then we should have the chair singular, and this is an iClone prop file. Okay, so we can click and drag and just bring this into our iClone scene, just like this. Okay, and there we go. There is our uh, chair um, brought in uh, singular. And if we want, we can you know rotate that around just like this. And I'm going to try and uh, uh, reset the pivot point here as well. So if you want to reset the pivot point in iClone. Notice that this one was, you know, we saved it onto this kind of to the side of the chair a little bit. What we can do is just set it to the middle like this, and there you set to a, a correct point. I think we have some additional vertexes over here, this, which is why it's not really centering correctly. Some vertexes that may be invisible, but generally you should be able to center it. And we can just manually do it here. Let's place it down there. Okay, and uh, good enough for me. That'll be our pivot points. Okay, then we can move the chair around like this and rotate it with the E hotkey, just like this, or on the blue axis like this. Okay, and if you want to, uh, you know, copy this chair and create more copies of it, what you can do is just uh, hold the control key, click and drag, and you can create additional copies just like this. Hold control and click and drag, and there you go. And if you want to save this as a chair for you know future use, you can also go up here to the content manager, go to uh, props over here or set rather under custom, you go to props, and then you can just go ahead and save it as you know single chair. Okay, and then you can click and drag and bring that in again. There you go. Okay, so simple enough. Um, and then if you want to just double check the materials, you can go over here to the materials and sometimes your materials may be, if I go to the base color map, maybe a little bit off, but this one seems to be okay, right? And it's also PBR texture. Okay, so that's really all I want to show you with the uh, kind of breaking apart the mesh in, in Blender there. I'll just have not used, I haven't opened Blender for uh, probably a few months at least. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we got some extra vertexes over here that are kind of just invisible to the human eye. So apologies for that. But um, this is what we're gonna do. And we're using that one chair, we saved it all. And the next thing we're gonna do here is take a, uh, take a prop from Sketchfab. We're gonna take an arcade uh, cabinet from Sketchfab, which I think is pretty cool. And we'll bring that and put it in the kind of corner over here underneath the stairs. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go into Sketchfab. I found this really cool Pac-Man arcade, um, free for download. And again, if you want to learn how to import in from uh, 3D Warehouse, you can go ahead and check out the, the previous version of this webinar, which I showed you in the, in the webinar archives. And if you want a link for that, I can send you, send you a link for that later on. But uh, I'm just gonna search for um, arcade, I believe is what I searched for. And we have this cool Pac-Man arcade. It's a really cool game. It's actually animated as well. And I'll show you that in just a moment. 
You can see the little uh, ghosts and Pac-Man moving around on the screen. Okay, so pretty cool. It's just an animated texture. And I'll show you that uh, a little bit later on. All right, so pretty cool machine, um, PBR textures. And we can you know, modify that machine if we want later on. Okay, but uh, again, all you have to do is just, uh, you can see the Pac-Man moving around. Um, just go ahead and download 3D model. Of course, you need to have your own account. Okay, so thanks to uh, Daniel Brook for uh, this model. And uh, it's a free download. Let's go ahead and download it. And we'll just download it in an original format, FBX. Okay, so author must be credited. Uh, I guess commercial use is allowed as long as uh, the author is credited. So thanks for that. Let's go ahead and download it. And you'll find this Pac-Man uh, arcade. Wow, it's going really slow. <laughs> let's close this down. Uh, I already have it downloaded. So let's just go to the uh, desktop here. I just unzip the file there. And uh, we have the uh, source, okay? So this is the object right here. Just This is the name of the FBX. It doesn't really matter what the name is. Uh, and these are the textures here, okay? So what I want to do is I'm just going to bring this into uh, 3D Exchange again. So click and drag directly into 3D Exchange and just import uh, everything, import animation, press OK. And here's our arcade cabinet. So this is, you know, relative size to our, our dude, okay? Now I'm not gonna worry about the materials here in 3D Exchange. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna add the materials in iClone. So all I'm gonna do here is just export this um, at, at the way it is right now, okay? And uh, you can see the animations here uh, are in there. That's kind of a, a prop animation. And uh, let's just go ahead and export this directly into iClone. So we can go into export to iClone and we can save it to the default folder here, which will be our default prop folder for iClone. Okay, if we select default, I'll show you where that is. It's very important to know this. And it's kind of easier to organize rather than, you know, exporting to the desktop first and everything. Uh, you can change your max texture size to whatever you want, uh, 4K. In this case, I'll just choose 2K, it doesn't really matter. And we'll just export everything. And uh, animation will export as well. Okay. All right, and then in iClone, I'll find that custom props folder here. Okay, so you can see it's the same folder. So under set, under custom tab, under props, you'll find this same full, or same item. And we can just call this, uh, let's call it arcade cabinet. Okay, and we'll uh, click and drag and bring it into our scene. And let's place those materials on this uh, item in here as well. Let's just uh, hold the, press the E hotkey to rotate it. Again, I'm a stickler for those angles, so I like to have it uh, exactly 90 degrees. And let's place it right up against the wall here. Okay, good stuff. So what we're gonna do is we're going to just replace all the materials on this and it can be found in that same folder. So let's go over here to materials. And um, what I can do is if you find your scene is a little bit too dark, what you can do, there's a couple of options you can, you can do, you can use. Um, the first one is to use auxiliary light right here. So my mouse is uh, hovering over auxiliary light. If you press that, it's just gonna make everything bright in your scene with no shadows. And this, can, this also saves a lot of resources as well. If you're, if you're um, editing your scene and you don't need the nice materials, uh, you, you, don't, you don't need to see everything, you're just doing like animation or something, auxiliary, auxiliary light is a good uh, option to have because it saves uh, system resources. You can see right now it's only using 1.7 out of 8 gigabytes up here of these uh, video memory. Whereas if we turn it off, it should be using a bit more. Um, there you go, 2.8 out of 8.1, okay? So one gigabyte difference uh, when you have auxiliary light on or off, okay? So just keep that in mind. If, you, if your computer is chugging along, just throw auxiliary light on and, and you know things will move a lot faster. I don't have to worry about that too much because I'm using a... 1080 uh, GTX NVIDIA right now, um, which, I, which I highly recommend. It's the best card for iCloud at this time, I think. Uh, okay, so let's load in a couple of textures here. So you can see there's, there's three meshes um, in this uh, object here. We have uh, Pac-Man machine, Pac-Man, and this Scheibe, I think, which probably means screen in German, because I think this guy is German. Um, so let's just go ahead into the Pac-Man machine. Uh, the material name is called Automat. So let's go to the base color map. And this folder here, it's in that same folder, so the textures. And albedo and diffuse are kind of used interchangeably, so we can just load up the albedo map, okay, for the base color. 
you can see there we got that taken care of. And there's a bump map on there as well. It doesn't really do much, but uh, just throw that on, import it as a normal map there. There is an ambient occlusion map, which uh, I'll show you the difference in, uh, actually, let's see if we can notice the difference in auxiliary mode here. Um, AO, or otherwise known as ambient occlusion. You can't really notice much in, uh, in auxiliary mode because it doesn't render the ambient occlusion. But if I go into regular mode here and I adjust the strength of my ambient occlusion, we need better lighting. If you want to like kind of just have a temporary light in your scene to shed light on something, you can also go to create, create light and create like a point light, okay? Um, or a spotlight. Point lights do not cast shadows, okay? Spotlights do cast shadows, so just keep that in mind. Point lights are kind of used just for ambient lighting. Um, another option you can use is to go to visual and, you know, you can uh, just activate the IBL, okay? And then we can increase the strength of the IBL and there we go. So our ambient occlusion, we take it down. You notice a very small kind of difference, especially around like this kind of area. All the way down. Notice especially around the edges, it's not as, not as shaded around the edges, whereas if we increase that strength, that's what ambient occlusion does. It kind of adds another, an extra sense of depth, okay? And I think we had a glow map as well, is that correct? Um, no, only a metallic and, oh, sorry, this is the emissive, yes. So automatic emissive, okay? And so this one is uh, this Pac-Man item on the top here. You can see if we turn that down. Okay, so just a glow map like this, so pretty cool. We can adjust the strength of that to uh, whatever we wish. And uh, let's take our metallic map in there as well. Um, just, I'm um, sure you select a unique texture. By default, it'll come across as a little texture between metallic and roughness, because sometimes I'll often use the same map, just kind of uh, a little bit uh, different values. Okay, and let's uh, take the roughness map there as well. And see so that is a unique texture. And uh, again, you can adjust the values of this, these two as well, um, the roughness and the metallic map. And the way you do that is let's bring our uh, strength down a little bit here. If I wanted uh, you know, a much more metallic look, for example, I could select metallic and I could go over here to adjust color. And what you want to do here is you can adjust the brightness. If your uh, overall map is, is much brighter, it's gonna create a much more metallic look for your uh, object. And uh, you can't really see that much. This, the, the outside looks a lot more metallic, whereas if we take this down, it'll look a bit more uh, matte, okay? So we'll have kind of less reflection on the outside of the, uh, the arcade cabinet there. Okay, so pretty cool. Um, this object, uh, I think it's a pretty, pretty great uh, map that this, uh, um, user has provided. Uh, we'll go to the next uh, material or next mesh, which is this is pack and ghost. And I think it's just a base color for this one. Um, albedo and emissive. Okay. And so the glow is the emissive. Okay. I'll we'll just throw that on. And this also, I think, has an opacity map. Uh, nope, that's the scene. Okay, so th this, this is the animated, uh, this is the animated texture right here. So if we go to the Shaib, which is, uh, I believe, screen, uh, we'll just uh, throw in the, all the stuff on the screen there as well. So base color um, is the, oh, we don't have a base color, the albedo. Okay, the albedo right there. So this is just kind of to create sort of a, it's really detailed kind of texture on, on the screen there, just kind of create some smudges and stuff. Um, opacity is the main one for this. Okay, so opacity, it's gonna be basically complete opacity, okay. So now you can see the screen up here. And then I believe there is a glow map on this one. So, no, just the roughness and metallic. Okay, metallic and roughness. And it's basically the same as the ones we have already right now. Okay, there you go. That's the texture. And if we play back, nothing happens. So what we need to do is we export the animation along with this prop. So we can right click it, go to perform. And uh, we probably could have named that something different instead of take 001. <laughs> we can see if we click that, then we can animate all these uh, objects on the screen right here. So pretty cool stuff. 
Um, really, really cool prop, I think. Um, and everything's done PBR as well. Um, so if we, you know, take take off our IBL, for example, um, let's go to our scene light. Take off our uh, key light, or all the other lights here. You can see it'll actually create um, this material. Um, the glow map is uh, quite nice. You can decrease that glow like this, just for the Pac-Man characters. And uh, the same thing for the uh, screen as well, or the uh, this one. You can see that that glow map will actually you know, create uh, lights and cast light into your scene. So it's pretty cool. All right, um, I think that's what it for this prop. We have about uh, 10 more minutes to get into a couple other things here. Um, I wanted to show you as well, I'm gonna bring these lights back on here, some uh, other stuff. Um, let's bring in a separate light here. Create, I'm just gonna create a uh, point light. And that should have created, I believe. Okay, where is it here? So let's press the F pot key to find it. Here it is. Okay, imported way over here. So let's just press the W hot key and bring it over here because this is where I want it to be. We're going to be looking at this uh, this door here. There's a couple of props I want to change the materials with substances. Okay, so this door is pretty cool. I mean, uh, it's just a basic door, door B. If you look at the materials here, you know we have a bump map, we have uh, metallic, all this stuff. Um, if we want, if we really want, we can go into our content manager. We can add uh, materials onto this as well. So we can go to media and the uh, substance pack I mentioned before. Uh, this one is visual essentials. Um, includes a number of different kind of settings. Uh, there's substance materials on this, uh, super substance tools. You can add aging to your, you know, doors or, you know, whatever object you have. Um, you can use uh, decals. Uh, you can change a bitmap to a material. Uh, to material. Um, all sorts of other fun stuff. And there's a library of different substances and HDRI fundamentals, um, lookup tables, otherwise known as LUTs. These are used for kind of tweaking the colors in your scene. Um, and we can talk more about that later if you have any questions, but I'll just go ahead and uh, close it down for now. And uh, what you can do is you can just click and drag any of these, you know, substances. Let's go to the PBR 200, uh, you know, something like uh, the wood one here. We can just, you know, throw this onto our, uh, our door like this, okay? Now the problem here is that, you know, just basically makes the entire door like one single piece of wood. But when you see like these uh, little algorithmic symbols on the bottom left of your textures here, that means it's a, uh, a substance material, okay? And the substance materials, they can be procedurally, uh, they're procedurally generated, they can be animated um, throughout your scene. So for example, if I wanted to age this door throughout the scene, I could do so by animating it. I'm just gonna control Z Probably a better thing to put this on the uh, floor, actually. Let's see what it looks like with the chestnut floor here. All right, not too bad, right? So what you could do with this floor here is you could procedurally, you know, animate this floor uh, by going down here. Um, you can bake the substance texture if you want, if you want to bake it. Um, there's a lot of other settings down here. So under substance, if you don't have a substance uh, on your applied to a prop, you won't have this little section here called substance, okay? So again, what we can do here is we can, you know, adjust, uh, you know, the wood roughness. Kind of create a bit uh, rougher. This is more like a slick surface, okay? So if we want it to be like a highly polished wood floor, we can do that. And of course, like I mentioned before, anything in icon that has green uh, text can be animated. So you could slowly change this uh, wood from like really, really metallic, really slick to really rough, okay? Gradually throughout the, uh, throughout the progression of your project. Um, and then there's you know, different channels where you can adjust uh, you know, different technical parameters. Uh, the finish type here, a little bit different, a uh, couple of different uh, options here for finish, um, the old finish here. Okay. So again, these are all built into that substance texture. And uh, I think you know, our, our natural one kind of looks the best. Uh, looks nice and fancy. And uh, there you go. Now, another thing you can do is under the substance super tools, there's uh, different uh, super tools here. There's a uh, decal, there's five channel mixer. There's stuff like aging, for example. If I click the aging onto here, onto my door, I can uh, adjust the aging. Now, again, um, it's going to get rid of, uh, again, the, the bolts and everything like that. So generally, you want to have this on a specific section 
a, spe a specific mesh that is part of your uh, object. Let's apply it to our, uh, oops. Oh. Okay, let's apply it to our uh, wall here is probably a better idea. Okay, so you see on the wall here, we can adjust and right now it's kind of tiled and there's you know various ways you can adjust this. So if I wanted to, for example, I can go to uh, output size, we can change that to like, you know, 2048, it'll be a bit more detailed. Uh, our mesh data, not really much to mess around with there, um, but you can uh, adjust the material here as well. Uh, now this will be uh, rock, not wood, okay? So underneath it will just kind of be rock. You can also have metal underneath it as well. Um, tweak, uh, you know, various things. Uh, I'm not going to use, mess around too much with this because you can go wild on all these things. Um, you can adjust the amount of erosion. Okay, um, the amount of edge decay. And uh, dirt, uh, you can enable it. You know, and just all sorts of different um, values you can mess around with here as well. I just kind of wanted to show you, um, you know, make like a really dirty wall if you want. Oh, that's pretty nasty. And then you know, adjust different patterns and you know, just create sort of a, an effect where, um, you know, you probably don't want to have too much dirt on it. But uh, and again, I'm just going to try and get rid of, uh, or try and add some more stuff on here. Some bleach won't do much in this case, actually. And uh, throw some paint on there as well. Now the inputs are up here and the material. Okay. And uh, all these values right here. Um, and again, you can just go wild with this and you know have a grand old time, you know, aging things just by throwing on that aging thing. I don't want to kind of spend too much time here. This is kind of, you know, tweaking different values and, uh, you know, going from there. And uh, you can tile it less as well. Um, so you can see that it's, it sort of looks a little bit too tiled. So what you'd probably want to do is create more randomness in it um, by going to, to your tiling um, and uh, adjusting that as well. Maybe I'd want to uh, zero point. Oops. There you go. A bit more of a interesting look. All right, so uh, you know, kind of create that cool looking uh, effect there. One final thing I want to do here is I want to uh, bring in a uh, a prop from the marketplace. So if you are uh, familiar with the marketplace, um, it's a really great place to find some uh, some props from developers, Relusion developers. Um, I'll just you know, it's marketplace.relusion.com, but I'll put it in the, uh, the chat window for you there. And uh, I'm just going to find this uh, geeks table that I have been looking at earlier. This is an icon asset from a developer called 3D Everything. Now, in the marketplace, um, you'll find two different options, one for eye content and one for export license. And all the marketplace stuff is done with DA points. So you can purchase your DA points um, uh, from your account. And uh, DA points are used in the marketplace. Okay, so uh, you know you purchase anything. It's like a hundred DA points for like one dollar or something like that, and uh, you can just purchase from here. Um, I content cannot be exported from iClone. So if you purchase the I content version, that means you can you can only use it within iClone. However, if you uh, purchase the export uh, version right here, that can be exported into FBX and everything. Um, if you, you can use it in other uh, other places as well. Okay, so I think that uh, this is the geek stream. You can kind of uh, search for yourself. I think it's a really good, basically everything from 3D, everything here is, is quite, quite good. The textures are quite professional and we get some really good results. And again, you can use uh, substance materials to modify yours as well. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and just, which you want to download this, you can just click on export. It's added to my cart. Let's go to cart up here and, you know, purchasing process. Nothing too complicated, just sign in checkout. I'm not going to show you the entire checkout process because that's uh, kind of redundant. I'm sure a lot of you probably know how to check out, um, but I've downloaded it. And once it downloads, it'll show up in your uh, props in this case. So I'm going to go over to, to uh, set uh, templates and props. 
and there's a special folder for 3D everything stuff. Okay, in Geek's room right here. And you can find like a, uh, there is a desk. There's a whole scene here as well, okay, if you want to bring the whole scene. Uh, so everything's really comprehensive, kind of put together really well. Uh, where is the desk? Put the American flag on the wall. Am I just skipping by it or am I? Oh, there we go, right here. Okay, let's just bring that in. And so now it kind of looks more like a like a cottage, almost in a way, you know, the, the old kind of uh, cracked up walls. I just kind of modified that. And I'll uh, we'll just throw this table over here, this desk over here. <laughs> you can see there's a desk with like some, uh, you know, beer bottles and a lava lamp and everything like that. Um, all this stuff, I'm gonna delete the point light now. Or let's just turn it off actually. Point light off. Okay. So now we have these uh, these screens right here. If we go to materials. These screens have glow maps as well, so it's pretty cool. Um, display right here. Um, right now we just have the display. If you want to, uh, you can add like a, a glow map in here. So I believe I thought they had glow maps. This one does, doesn't it? It appears they do not, but uh, what you can do is you can just take this uh, diffuse map and save it out. This will make a fine glow map. Just save it as to your desktop. So I'm just, you know, taking this diffuse map. I just went down here to uh, save, okay, uh, right here. And I'm saving it uh, onto my desktop. Okay, and then I'm going to write a glow map here and go to the desktop and take this, okay. So when you do that, it's kind of a little trick. You can, um, you know, add some more glow, okay, to your diffuse map, just like this, uh, by adjusting the strength slider down here, okay. If your scene is completely dark, you, you'll be able to see that glow kind of, uh, you know, nicely affecting everything. Oh, we need to take off our, uh, I think we also have a, uh, Let's do our effect off. Oh yeah, we have these lights, I forgot. Dependent lights. Let's turn them all off. Okay. So with this, uh, if you have global illumination uh, set on, um, global illumination over here, again, we can talk a bit more about global illumination later as well. Uh, glow maps will actually produce uh, global illumination. So if we click on visuals right here, um, you have it active, I believe. If you go over here to global illumination, um, you can add, increase your bounce strength. Um, let's see. Let's create more light coming from this. I'm trying to get the light to kind of cast a green glow here on our, uh, let's try this. Nope. Uh, I want the, the green light to cast a kind of a light on our keyboard there. It's doing it slightly. You can't really see. I mean, my, my screens, I'm kind of in a bright room right now, so it's kind of hard for me to see these details. Um, but yeah, global illumination is the way to, to take care of that. Um, and uh, you can do as materials here. And uh, here you go. Illumination uh, settings. And this one should be should produce more strength from the uh, if I'm creating oh the wrong item I would help yeah here we go okay so now you can see the keyboard is turning greener because um, the individual scale here um, the global illumination scale is on so we kind of have that nice you know ambient green glow on the keyboard and that's what I was trying to achieve. Uh, you can adjust the light bound, light bound strength and stuff like that. Um, but that's a bit more of a realistic. Uh, and we can do the same thing for the Pac-Man, for example. This one will probably be a better example of it. There you go. So it's creating that kind of like backlight and everything. And if you have an object like this, just bring in like a um, primitive shape, like a box or something. And where is it? Oops. If we bring that in front of our 
pack command machine should be kind of the <laughs> better result of the effect of, of the global illumination on the magnet. So you can see now it's, it's casting, even though there's no lights in the scene, it's casting a, a nice light on this uh, box right here. If we put a character in there, we can, you know, have a better example as well. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave character creation. It's gonna be very very basic character creation to the next uh, webinar on Thursday, and then we'll also do animation in that one as well. Um, for the last thing, I'm just gonna bring a character in here. Zane, we'll throw Zane in front of a uh, the arcade. Okay, so that's about all I'm gonna cover in this uh, you know um, scene setup tutorial or webinar rather. If you have any questions, um, uh, now's the time to put them in the Q and A section, and uh, we'll get to those in just a minute here. Um, so. Again, um, Q and A, Q and A like panel there. In your go to webinar. Uh, make sure you put everything in there, and uh, we'll be good to go in just a sec. I, uh, I like that nice kind of subtle lighting uh, cast from the machine onto his face there. Good stuff. Seems like he's a little tall for this machine. I want to scale it up. Oop. There we go. Oh, by the way, the R hotkey is used for scaling. Uh, sometimes I just kind of go through those. Um, w, E, and R are used for movement, rotation, and scale. Okay, cool. That's about it for this uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to go to the uh, Q&A section now, guys. So any questions, please put them in there. You can ask me questions about other Reillusion products as well if you're interested. Looks like we already got a few here. Um, uh, Sam Schneider has a question about uh, CC clothing. So, some of the clothing I put on, some of the clothing I put on my model will make other clothing disappear. Putting on a holster. Let's load up character creator while I'm going through this because character creator sometimes takes a bit of bit of time to load. Close down Blender. Um, okay, so um, when putting on a holster, it will disappear, and then the missing item is not in my scene tab. Uh, okay, so Sam, this is a pretty easy fix. Um, when you are adding uh, items to your character, clothing to your character, whether it be props or accessories or clothing or anything like that, you have to make sure that each one has its own layer. Now, um, the once character creator loads up, I can show you where to find um, all the layers. There's something like 15 layers that you can add to your character. And you know, you can, you can adjust, you can assign different layers to different items. So, for example, you know, underwear would be layer one because that's the closest to your skin, right? Um, and then you know, uh, shorts would be like layer two. T-shirt could be layer three, uh, and stuff like that. So, what you want to do is you want to make sure that each of your um, the items that you're trying to add to your character, they're all on different layers. Um, uh, so, I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. Here, I'll just close down this Q and A panel. So this character, I will just use this default character on the screen. We've got a clothing, um, underwear. So most of the underwear stuff by default is assigned the same layer. So if I was to replace, you know, um, let's say for example, I was to add this bra, this white bra on, for example, you can see in the bottom left there, it says zero one. And that means that indicates layer one. Okay, so that's closest to the body. Uh, zero two on the boxers here indicates zero two. So technically, you could have you know these little bikini bottoms. Um, well, no, those those are, those are assigned to layer two as well. Um, but you can see that one would replace the other. So I could you know give her uh, you know checkered boxers for some reason. <laughs> if, she, if she was wearing checkered boxers, there you go, and uh, you know a white bra for example. Um, you can choose to replace or material only. Doesn't really matter. But those would replace the items on the screen already, or on the character already. Whereas if, if I went over here to uh, to shirts, for example, notice that with shirts, this biker vest is even assigned, you know, 13. So that's like way up there. Okay, the noodle strap top here is a 07, so I can like throw that on, and I can throw the biker vest on top of that. Okay, um, you can see the holes are kind of poking through there, but uh, let me just go over here to uh, uh, conform. I'll just kind of calculate the collision that she did the trick. There we go. And we'll just throw that biker vest on top of there. So she's going to have a cool, uh, badass looking biker jacket <laughs> just wearing with the boxers. Right? Not something you see every day. Person with a leather biker jacket and, uh, and boxers on. Um, but that's kind of, you know, kind of goes to show you. 
And if you want to, you know, find the layers of your character's clothing, you go up to uh, do, do edits. Wait, did it modify? Yes. Modify cloth layer settings here. Okay. And you can adjust the, uh, the layers and, and the numbers and everything here. Just go to settings and change collision order to whatever number you want. Okay. So hopefully that helps out. Um, that issues com commonly occurs when you have, you know, two items that you want to add onto the same, uh, same collision order. Okay. And that'll adjust this number right here. So notice there's 13, seven, two, and one. Okay. Hopefully that answers that question for you there, Sam. Uh, Patrick uh, mentions here. Okay, so for the next webinar, is it possible that two motions in a sequence might not be compatible? The last time I created a scene, everything went well up to when the character was blown away and dropped on his back. I wasn't able to follow that sequence with another animation for him to get back up. Um, okay, uh, yeah, um, on Thursday, we'll probably have a scenario where I, I can kind of show you that. I'll leave a bit of time at the end um, for that uh, animation. I mean, uh, Patrick, what I would recommend is maybe just send me your, your project file, because um, it's kind of hard to kind of determine, because there's so many things you can do in animation in iClone. There's like there's clips, there's a keyframe animation, there's motion capture, uh, and, you, and you can have keyframes that you don't even know are there and they can be interfering with a lot of other stuff. So if I could take a look at your project, it might be better, I, I can help you with that and uh, you know, um, get back to you. Um, so just, you can just email that to me. My email is uh, kai at reillusion.com. Uh, it's kai, K-A-I, at reillusion.com. I can probably take a look at that for you. And uh, hopefully, um, at least uh, at the very least on Thursday, I'll be able to provide you with a solution there. Um, okay. So hopefully uh, we can get that taken care of. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, sorry about the uh, the Blender mistakes there uh, for Orlando. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I, I messed around with Blender and I normally just use uh, Max or Maya these days. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, Blender is quite universal. So apologies to Orlando for that. Um, so uh, Nate asks here, you showed how to age the wall. How would you start with adding the brick wall? Um, okay, so I can show you really quickly how to just create a brick wall from scratch, I guess. Um, it's a very useful kind of tool um, to, to learn. Is if you want to uh, create, just go to create a primitive shape or you can create surface up here. Um, you can create a room, okay, if, if you want to do that. You can create a plane, which is just like a plane on the ground. A primitive shape, you can create like a floor or, or a box, okay, for a wall. Um, my basic starting point for creating a wall would be to primitive shape and box and then just um, press the W hotkey and we'll bring it over here. It always, it always adds to your scene root there. So here's our box. Let's just bring our light on so you can see it. Or let's just use aux light here. Okay. So what I would do is I just bring in this box, press the R hotkey. I would scale it this way like this and then maybe scale it up on the uh, green axis or the y axis and then the z axis like that so there's a wall okay um that's my wall and what you can do is just go to uh content and go to your media up here and substance okay and then you know you wanted a brick wall this substance folder comes uh, default with iclone okay so all I can do is I can just click and drag this bricks onto there like that. And there you go. So obviously um, not ideal <laughs> the, way it's, uh, the way it applied. So what you want to do is you want to go over here to uh, materials and you want to make sure that you uh, um, make sure that all your uh, base color and everything is set okay first. Okay, we have a box default. And the reason it applies like this is because we took that, that box. If we, if we go to wireframe mode for the box, like if we just select wireframe mode here, you can see this box is actually a very, very simple geometry, okay? And uh, when you have a simple geometry like this and you apply a substance material to that geometry, it's going to create a very, very simple material appearance, okay? Um, so let's uh, go ahead to uh, normal back. And uh, in that case, what you want to do, what you have to do in this case, is you have to go down to your, uh, there's a few ways you can adjust this. In the substance area, you can go to output size and change this to like a higher resolution. 
case now you can see more detail on that. And uh, channels, uh, I'll find basic parameters. Uh, this one doesn't have anything to do with the uh, tiling, uh, advanced parameters. You can adjust the bricks amount X, so like this, um, brick amount Y, okay. Now, what you need to do in, in the end is actually go down to UV tiling and you can apply it to like box and go ahead and apply. And that should normally uh, resolve the issue. I'll just select box, okay, because iClone knows it's a box and it'll kind of just, uh, you know, generate a, a look like this. Uh, what you can also do is you can tile it. So if I press like two, for example, and uh, two for U and V, I can apply that, get even more bricks. And uh, what I also may want to do is kind of take this a little bit more further like this. And uh, you know, there, there's, there's your basic brick wall. And once it's like this, then you can probably get a better look at you know, adding, adding more age onto it or, or less age, okay? So these are basic parameters. You have less brick amount on the Y, okay? It's like that, um, more brick amount on the X. And you can adjust all those things. So th this is the cool thing about substances is you can modify these things in real time and you can also animate them as well, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind. That's how I would generally go about creating a simple wall. And then again, if you want, you can hold the control key, click and drag and create a second wall. And that second wall would have the exact same textures, materials. Press E to rotate and just go up here and rotate uh, 90 degrees, not on the materials here. This, and there you go. Just like that. So there's, you know, two walls of your room. Now, if you wanted to uh, snap these together, I believe it's in preferences. So you can go up to uh, edit and uh, preferences. And there's uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, snap to model and snap to grid, okay? So if you use snap to model, you can also use the control M hotkey for this, snap to model. What it'll do is you'll see it'll snap, like just like that. It'll kind of snap into position. I'm not sure if it's easy to tell, but I can just snap right to position like that. So then the wall will look like this, okay? We have a nice um, corner wall just like that. All right, hopefully that uh, helps there. That's kind of important when it comes to, you know, setting up your own scene, so. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Okay, let's get to the next question here. Uh, Daryl asks, in a 3D anaglyph scene, how do you set the best 3D imaging depth? Um, I haven't really done any, any of that kind of stuff, uh, Daryl, but kind of maybe if you give me an example, um, just sh shoot me over an email. And if you give me an example uh, for imaging depth uh, that you're working with, I can uh, give you the best solution because I can talk to our engineers um, but I, myself, I don't do anything in, in terms of uh, anaglyph uh, 3D settings, uh, imaging depth. Um, I haven't really done in a long time. Uh, so maybe if you can kind of clarify the question or maybe just send, send me the question via email a little bit later, I can probably get into more detail on that for you. All right, so Miriam is asking, in order to import or export props to Blender, do I need to purchase 3D Exchange? Um, Okay, so to import props from Blender to iClone, uh, this is a very common question. Uh, to import stuff from Blender to iClone, uh, you do need 3D Exchange, but you only need the Pro version, okay? So Pro version allows you to import anything into the iClone environment. However, if you wanna export stuff from iClone to external formats, then you'll need the pipeline version. So, uh, exchange. Yeah, so keep that in mind. There's a, there's a couple of versions here, the, the pipeline version and the pro version, but I uh, highly recommend uh, just picking up the, uh, the pipeline version uh, because it allows easy, easy um, transfer back and forth, okay? So 3D exchange pipeline, this one right here. All right, so it really depends. Um, but I think right now it's mostly just a pipeline uh, all over the place. Okay. So um, hope that answers that question for you there. Yeah, so you would need a 3D exchange pipeline. Um, answer your question there, Miriam. And okay, next question from Simon. I noticed there is a PBR and lighting plugin for iClone called Indigo. Are there any plans to replace this plugin? Um, well, to be honest, Indigo is a bit older. Um, now we use iRay. Um, 
I can show you a quick render with iRay. Um, let's just go ahead and uh, close this down really quick here. Um, character creators taking up a lot of resources, but let's just go into our, uh, I want to kind of see what uh, this looks like with an iRay render here. Let's give our character a pose. Oops. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. I wanted to, uh, one good thing about, um, let's delete that point right there as well. One good thing about iRay is that it's, you know, photorealistic rendering, a lot better than Indigo. I'd highly recommend it. Um, I'll kind of just Google that really quickly here. Plug in iClone. Yeah, this one right here. Um, photorealistic rendering. You can go look at this page on your own time. I don't want to go through it too much. I'll just show you a quick render. Uh, Chat. So I'll throw this in the chat window here. Um, let's do a quick render here with uh, iRay. I'm not sure how it'll look uh, turn out, but uh, again, iRay is you know fairly good when it comes to this sort of stuff. So uh, plug in iRay render. And I think the toolbar should be up there. There we go. Okay, and just preview it. And I'll get to the next question. So I just wanted to uh, mention that to you, Simon, that uh, iRay is, is the updated version. We're no longer really um, doing a lot of updates for Indigo. Uh, it's most iRay these days. And we do have plans possibly to um, offer support for future uh, other uh, render types as well. OK, and I'll just go on to Dean's question uh, up here next. Uh, a question about character creator. When I try to import an FBX file from Maya, it's asking me for the FBX key. Where, the, where in the world can I find a key? Okay, so yeah, when you're exporting um, directly, the FBX file directly into iClone, it's gonna ask you for an FBX key. And this is, this is sort of a kind of a, it can be a tricky thing. And the reason why it's tricky is because uh, when you export an FBX file from iClone or from 3D Exchange, it will generate a little key, okay, um, an FBX key. And you won't, be able to, you won't be able to import that same file in again unless you have that same key. Uh, and this is to prevent, um, you know, pir piracy of, of, you know, developer content and stuff like that in general. Um, this one, uh, oops. Uh, this one is a FBX. Um, so this is from when you export from a uh, uh, character creator. So if I went to file and export um, FBX clothed character, for example, it'll generate an FBX key, or it should. And then you'll need that same key when you import back in. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Because so, basically it's just to prevent people from kind of like taking the, uh, the file and just exporting it and just using it wherever. It can kind of assign an FBX key. To any FBX that's exported from Character Creator, we assign like an FBX key, and so that if we find it, you know, being sold on some illegal marketplace, we can kind of trace it back to uh, wherever it came from, and you know, uh, deal out some discipline to that account. Um, so that's that's when you export from uh, FBX from Character Creator, you get that FBX key. Okay, and that'll the same thing will apply to you know props that you export from Character Creator as well. Make this, uh, all right, so there you go. You got a decent looking kind of uh, render here. Um, zoom in a little bit more here. Um, so, you know, photorealistic rendering, looking pretty cool. Uh, the lighting is very dark, but again, you can obviously you can adjust all the lighting as well. Let's we go over here. Let's load up our uh, IRE render settings here. Um, these ones here. Well, it's been a while since I use this as well. Tone mapper, there we go. Their settings. So you can increase the exposure if you want. And uh, so that'll increase your exposure without really um, needing, to, needing to restart your render. Okay, and there's you know various uh, templates you can use as well. 
I can adjust the kind of boom filters if you want. Um, the templates are over here. And these are kind of fun to mess around with. You can you know, have a really good old time with all these uh, templates and you know adjust those a little bit later on as well. That's just a quick render from uh, you know iRay. Again, not the ideal lighting situations. I'd probably want to adjust this a bit more, give it some more time to render, not have character creator running in the background because this takes up a lot of resources for my poor little laptop here. Um, okay, anyways, so hopefully that answers your question there, Dean. If you have any, any specific scenarios that you're kind of confused with, just feel free to give me, a, give me an email and I'll help you through that. Um, some things take a bit more time than I'd like to invest uh, during the uh, live webinar here. Um, it's kind of like to talk to you guys one-on-one -on -one to resolve specific issues is more efficient, I think. Um, okay, so Ray says, importing a character creator into Unreal, if the clothing looks correct until you assign animation in Unreal, then the skin shows through the clothing. Example would be walking or running. Um, yeah, this, this can occur in certain situations. Um, now, the, the solution for this is, I mean, you can modify the mesh. Um, my ideal solution for this, if you ever see uh, skin uh, showing through your character clothing in Unreal after you've exported from character creator, what you want to do is when you export from character creator, make sure you hide all hidden mesh, okay? Um, because inevitably, you know, different, different uh, editing environments are going to have different, you know, parameters and there's going to be a little bit of discrepancy um, between the mesh position uh, in, in certain, uh, you know, certain files and certain editing environments. So when you export, um, so you want to export to FBX to go to Unreal, for example, uh, you choose the Unreal preset and you'd want to definitely um, delete hidden mesh down here, okay? Make sure you have delete hidden mesh selected and you can avoid that because delete hidden mesh, any mesh that's not showing on the surface, it'll just delete it, okay? Um, and what you also want to do is make sure that your character, um, say for example, if I select this shirt, I can go down here to uh, edit mesh on the shirt. I believe we have the shirt selected, right? I'm just gonna stop that render. This is just slowing down my computer like crazy here. All right, so there's a cool render, I don't know. I can show a better one later, but uh, yeah, so select the top for example and go to edit mesh. And what you'd want to do is just kind of, uh, you know, basically you can make anything you don't want visible. You can manually do this as well. So if I wanted to say, for example, I could just select you know, this area here. Let's get rid of that uh, top like your vest for now. So, oh gosh, okay. So the strap top, so select this whole thing right here and we can just, uh, you know, make it invisible. Not the whole thing. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, face. There we go. Okay, so we can select uh, certain faces here. And we can hide certain faces, okay, like this. Right, certain parts right here, we can hide them. And uh, there you go. Okay, so you can't really see them from that side. And if we put the biker vest on top of it, you know, you can't really see it except for this section over here. So you'd want to like reveal this section back here. Uh, just like this and then show. Okay, but then this, you know, section over here would be hidden. So um, ideally, you know, hiding certain parts of your mesh uh, is, is the best way to avoid that when you come across those situations in Unreal. Because I've, I've personally come across those situations and I deal a lot with Unreal these days. And uh, that's what I've, that's the solution that I've used many times. Just delete the hidden mesh, um, delete stuff that you don't need to show and that you should be okay. Um, okay. Uh, Toby Johnson asks a question here. Uh, can you record your voice while using live face? Uh, yeah, you definitely can. There's an option to record your voice and uh, record the audio from your voice while you're doing the facial mocap. Um, uh, we won't go into too much detail on that. We can probably cover that in the next uh, webinar since that covers animation mostly. Okay, Zola. After importing Daz characters into CC3 pipeline, do I also need 3D exchange to get that character into iPhone 7? Um, 
No. Uh, once you've imported the DAS character into CC3 pipeline, um, it has become, uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Do, 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 do. So you have always had 3D exchange. Importing a DAS character into CC3 pipeline, you can't do it unless you already have 3D exchange, to my knowledge, um, at least 3D exchange pro, because uh, you need uh, that to import um, a DAS character. As far as I know, uh, DAS character into CC3 pipeline. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you need it to get into CC3 even. Um, the CC3 pipeline has the DAS import. Okay, so yeah, once it's once it's a CC3 format, you shouldn't need 3D Exchange to get into Icon 7. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you should. If you can get into CC3, then you can save it as an iAvatar, in which case you don't really need to worry about uh, 3D Exchange. I'll have to like get back to you on that. I'm pretty sure that's the way it is though. But uh, yeah, I'll have to kind of test that up, test that theory out myself. And if, you ha if you're having trouble with that, if, if you don't have 3D Exchange and uh, you're having trouble importing that DAS character into CC3 pipeline, just let me know. Um, Cause I'd like to take a look at that. I haven't really come across that issue um, in a while. Um, okay, Joe has a good question here. What, what type of CPU do you recommend, RAM and VRAM? Um, when you're using iClone, it's recommended, um, I would recommend, to be honest, um, NVIDIA uh, GTX 1080. Um, that seems to be the sweet spot for, for the current version of iClone. And uh, like, like, like I mentioned, I'm using a 1080 right now on a laptop, and it's, it's just, it's working fine. You know, nothing goes too slow. I, I don't see much experience, much lag. Um, the VRAM is the most important, eight gigabytes uh, at least. Of, of video RAM, if you can, if you can, uh, uh, you know, afford that. Um, trying to figure that out. Um, RAM is just mainly used if you're uh, having running more than one program at once. Uh, RAM is not really going to affect the operation of iPhone unless you're running multiple programs at once. Um, and the CPU, not really a huge deal um, in terms of uh, video editing and uh, animation and stuff. It does have to be, you know, able to keep up. Excuse me, with your with your video card though. Okay, uh, Emmanuel asks, uh, on a Thursday, can you show how to save the last frame of an animation sequence of Avatar into iClone and start the new frame, new project with that frame and the character in the same position? Yeah, definitely we can do that. Um, <laughs> I can definitely help you out with that, uh, Emmanuel. Um, just maybe remind me, it's not really difficult to do, um, but I can probably just uh, whiz through that in a couple of minutes to show you how to do that. Uh, okay, Zola asked the question, when are we getting dynamic appearance editor for CC3 pipeline? Uh, this is in the near future. Um, it's been, uh, we've been kind of uh, parlayed a little bit with uh, the Unreal Live Link thing recently, uh, again, which is what I've been working on for the most part. Um, but the dynamic appearance editor for CC3 pipeline, I, I, have, I have seen um, beta of it uh, already. Not really beta, just kind of testing of it already. So. Uh, that is, I can't give you a solid answer on that, but it's in, it's in the works. It's definitely in the pipeline. Uh, no pun intended. But, uh, yeah, dynamic appearance editor uh, is one thing that has been in high demand for quite a while. So I'll have to ask you just to wait a little longer, I guess, on that one. Uh, okay, so Samson has a question. When I follow the video tutorial for Daz import of Genesis 8 characters, Boots, their feet still don't position properly in 3D exchange even when foot pose is applied in case prior to export for 3D exchange. Expressions work though. Um, this can be a little bit of an issue depending on if your character has high heels or not uh, when you import your dad's character. If that character has high heels, um, you do need to, uh, there's an extra step that you do need to follow. Um, I won't kind of go through it in this uh, webinar here since we kind of are limited for time, but uh, feel free to email me, Samson. I'll kind of show you uh, the, the process for getting the, those feet adjusted for characters who have high heels or boots or, or whatnot in, uh, in DAS and importing those um, into uh, iClone or 3D exchange. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a simple fix for it, just a, a couple extra clicks. 
Okay, uh, Nate has a question. Any info on 3D Exchange future roadmap? Um, 3D Exchange is going to, it's possibly going to be integrated um, into Icon as a plugin. Uh, now, that's not in the immediate future, but it's something that we kind of want to, it's kind of, the, 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 the way we're going with it right now is we're going to kind of try to make it more of a plugin uh, for iClone as opposed to a standalone program. Now, uh, when exactly that's going to be implemented, uh, I'm not sure. But that's kind of the, the future roadmap for, for uh, 3D Exchange without giving, you know, too much away. Um, let's go into the next one here. Yassine asks, what the max, what's the maximum video size iClone can process? Um, I've done up to, up to 8K in iClone. Um, I mean, <laughs> not really many reasons why you'd want that. Um, but you can go up to render and, uh, you know, render video and see all the options here. Oops. Um, yeah, so these are all your options right here. Uh, you can just adjust to whatever you want. You know, viewport resolution, ultra HD, um, and, uh, you know, lots of other options. Output size. You want to make sure that your output size is, you know, set to uh, whatever you need it to be. Uh, you know, 8,500 something like that. So it would look like this. Okay. And that'd be a custom frame size. All right. So you, again, you can export to whatever uh, size you need. All right. But generally, you know, ultra HD is enough for most people. Um, okay. Uh, Sam asks a question here. Can I import a photo from a, can I import a photo I have on my PC to use as an image plane? Yeah, you definitely can. That's super easy to do. Um, the easiest way to import a photo is an image plane. Um, just right click and drag it from your uh, explore window. Let's go to pictures here. I have pictures, backgrounds. Like if I wanted this creepy tree background, I can right click and drag it in. Again, right click and drag and just import it in as a plane, image layer, IBL, or billboard. Okay. Or background texture if you want as well. Um, you know, import as a plane is fine. And then, uh, you know, because there's no license in the scene, I probably actually want to import in as something else. It'd be kind of cool to see this imported in as an IBL. It has a really kind of eerie blue light. And then we can go over here to uh, our IBL. And whoop. activate. It's kind of like a creepy. Uh, now you can imagine if, if, the, if the outer woods look like this, we get a kind of a creepy look like this. But obviously you want to decrease that strength. So it has a fairly strong value there, make it very subtle. I'd probably use something like this. And you could have that light coming in the window, that, uh, that main scene light, key light there and change it to like a blue, kind of creepy cold blue color. There you go. Now it's a totally different uh, atmosphere you can see here. And if we want, under visual, we can also um, go down here and do, 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 do. Oh, we need to make it sure it's the sky. I believe we are able to apply this to the sky. Mm -hmm. Nay, you can bake the IBL and everything like that. Um, they need to put a sky here. Hey, well, I'll figure it out some other day. So I kind of got, uh, I get easily distracted. Uh, so that's how you can anyways import the image as a plane. Kind of going off on a tangent there. Uh, okay, so yes, scene asks what's the maximum length and time for a scene. Um, I mean, you can adjust the time as much as you want. Let's go down here to, uh, to settings and change your total frames, I don't know, like a million maybe. Uh, it looks like 10,000, so maybe 999,000, sorry, uh, 9,999 frames for a first single project. And honestly, you don't wanna have a project longer than this because the longer your project is, uh, the n more frames in your project, uh, the more it's going to, uh, you know, a lag on your system. So try and keep your projects uh, small and efficient. 
and you can you can patch them together in uh, Premiere or whatever uh, video editing software you use later on. All right. Okay, so thanks uh, help let's help that out. Uh, Frank asks on a on animation, why do I get nine hundred frames in a render when icon timeline shows eighteen hundred? Uh, it's probably your frames per second on your export settings. Uh, Frank, when you export, you want to make sure that your frames per setting are frames per setting. Uh, let's see here. Where are we? Uh, that should be in render render video. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, frame rate. Okay, there's your frame rate. So uh, you may want to make sure that your frame rate is the uh, same. Okay, so if it's more than 30 or less than 30, you want to make sure it's the same uh, as, as your project. Okay, um, so project settings go here, and there's also a frames per uh, frame rate here, I believe. Yeah. Uh, maybe preferences. Total frames here. Yeah. Can be preferences. But I'm sure you can also adjust your frames per second here as well. Hmm. Okay, somewhere, somewhere here. Anyways, that could be an issue that you're having there. If, and if, if that doesn't fix it, if your uh, uh, frame rate uh, uh, setting here doesn't fix it, um, let me know, because that's kind of an interesting uh, occurrence. I've never had any problems with that, um, you know, uh, frames per second. Uh, I believe that uh, you need to make sure that your uh, render settings are correct when you're exporting. Uh, they, sh they should be uh, 30 frames per second. All right. Okay, so Emmanuel asks another question here. When will it be possible to import HRD in standard format from other sources? Or we'll be able to import um, HDR scenery skies directly from DAS 3D? Uh, right now, do, 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 do. the HDR input is, we're still working on that right now. Um, that's that's kind of coming up in the near future here as well. Um, importing them directly from DAS, that's something that we've had a lot of requests for. You know, a lot of people, they want to uh, import their projects from DAS exactly as they are. And that's, that's one thing that we're really focusing on right now because we see there's a, a really strong desire for people to bring in their projects uh, exactly as they are for Max, for Maya with exact cameras, exact lighting and everything like that. So we're kind of consistently working on that and vice versa, you know, to export your iClone scene, to uh, export the cameras, export the lights, everything from iClone into other software as well, working on that uh, at all times. Um, in terms of the specific one with uh, importing uh, HDR from DAS, um, not entirely sure um, because I think that's, uh, but it's something that, you know, because we have so many, so many requests for it, it's something that we're constantly working on and we'll get to that, uh, you know, hopefully um, in the near future here uh, for all you, for all you DAS users there. Um, so Frank's asking here, can you render at uh, 24 frames per second? Yeah, just to render at uh, 24 frames per second from here as well. I'll uh, just change that to 24 and that should uh, work just fine. Um, okay, I think uh, I've answered about all the questions here. Uh, again, guys, uh, question, um, the webinar on Thursday will be mostly focused around animation, a little bit around lighting. I think we covered most of the basics. I kind of went through like a really uh, whirlwind tour of global illumination. Um, but if you want, if you have any more questions, anything you want to learn for the next webinar, um, feel free to just email me and uh, send me an email and uh, any topics that you'd like to cover, I can try and throw those in um, because we're, we're kind of having a modified version. Uh, the, the previous version of this webinar script had a uh, uh, three, three day tutorial or three day webinar uh, where the last one was hosted by, by uh, Chris uh, Stuck on 3D um, to talk about global illumination and, and the, the finer details of lighting which I just kind of whizzed through here. Um, but uh, yeah, any, 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 other, any other topics you'd like to cover, uh, just let me know, because we'll have, I'll try and make a bit more time for other topics as well. Uh, all right, so I think that's it. I think we've answered all the uh, questions. Um, thanks everyone so much for attending. 
Uh, and again, apologies for the blender snafu there, but uh, make sure that you check out our, uh, our YouTube channel for all the updated tutorials and everything like that. Um, always new tutorials coming out. Uh, we're going to be launching into the live link tutorials here pretty soon. Uh, right now, we're just kind of working through the last few for Cartoon Animator 4. Um, but then, yeah, uh, live link and, and Unreal stuff is going to be coming up soon, which I'm really excited about. And uh, again, the content store special, you saw that um, the uh, supermodel characters with the uh, Light Studio pack, um, check it out as well. Uh, highly recommended. Um, and a survey as well. Uh, any topics you'd like to uh, you know, talk about in future webinars. Um, again, like we're getting into the Unreal stuff, so we'll probably have some Unreal uh, webinars in the near future as well. Um, it's becoming more and more popular for people to kind of uh, you know, create their indie, indie, indie movies and stuff in uh, engines like Unreal and, and Unity. Um, okay, so I think that's about it, yeah. Um, and again, 10% discount for the content store if you fill out that survey for us. Um, so thanks so much everyone for, uh, for attending. I'd love to have you along for the ride. Uh, hopefully you enjoy all the other tutorials as well. And again, my email is uh, kai at realvision.com. So any uh, specific questions you have that may have been kind of skipped over here, it may, may have taken too long uh, in, other, in other ways. Um, just feel free to send me those questions, shoot them over uh, via email, and I'll try my best to, uh, to get it fixed for you. Because I know how frustrating it can be to work, out, work on the same problem over and over and over again when you can't find a solution. All right, so anyways, so yeah, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, uh, you guys, and I hope to see you in the next webinar. And so we'll just uh, end it off there.